Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mark Clarfield, previously head of Medical School for International Health, Ben Gurion University, speaking to you from Be sunny Beersheba in Israel, seven o'clock at night here and around the world, different hours. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Global Health Forum, which we hold every month or so. Normally, uh, under normal circumstances, we have guests who come to Beersheba, who wash up in Beersheba, who we invite to Beersheba, come and give talks to our students through our medical school. But of course, this is a different year. We didn't want to lose that function. And so we've used the uh, miracle of Zoom to bring you people from around the world. And it really is, really is a personal and professional pleasure to welcome Dr. Joe Sacrin tonight. The most important thing I can say about Joe is he's a mensch. He's a great guy, a lovely, lovely person, a fine doctor. The second most important thing I can tell you about him is he's an alumnus of MSIH. He was a student here, one of our best, went on, as you'll hear shortly, to do all kinds of wonderful things. You can see on his screen what he's done. He has a bunch of titles. I'm not going to read them to you. He's a general surgeon. He's an emergency general surgeon, and he's had some fantastic experiences that he's going to share, some of, some of which he's going to share tonight. He's going to speak to us about health equity, probably know the better tomorrow. I will interrupt at around 40 minutes to remind Joe, we want to have time for questions and answers. Please put them in the chat box and I'll do my best to collate them. So without further ado, Dr. Sakran, the floor is yours and thank you so much for zooming into us today. Joe. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor. It is uh, really just a great honor to be with all of you, um, not, just as someone uh, who uh, has really just a special place in his heart for, uh, for Israel, for MSIH, and honestly for all the incredible uh, relationships that I have built uh, since my time there as a medical student. So uh, it's a real honor and privilege, and uh, I really look forward to um, a robust uh, discussion and dialogue uh, I can't promise I have all the answers, um, but uh, I'm excited to also learn from uh, the experience and breadth of individuals uh, on this uh, Zoom uh, call. So uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. You know, uh, I can't really begin uh, talking about uh, health equity uh, without really telling you my own story. And uh, I'll just tell you that this is gonna be a little bit of a different uh, type of talk than you may expect. And so uh, it's one of those things where um, I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, you'll realize that each and every one of you, regardless of what you're passionate about, uh, have a story to tell. And being able to tell, tell that story is so critical to being able to move the needle forward on so many of the things that each and every one of us are passionate about. My uh, story actually all began right outside of uh, Washington, D.C. in a place called Fairfax, Virginia. Some of you may be familiar with it. I, I was born at Fairfax Hospital and uh, born to the son of immigrants uh, that came to the States uh, over 50 years ago. I think in search of uh, the you know, better life that is so typical of the immigrant story. And at the age of 17, my life really changed after I went from being a healthy high school senior to collateral damage uh, and nearly being killed when I was shot in the throat with a 38 caliber bullet. And so it's really hard for me to start uh, talking to you really about anything, but especially about these issues without recognizing uh, the two uh, surgeons, Dr. Bob Ahmed on the left, and Dr. D. Mukherjee on the right, who along with their teams uh, gave me this second chance, uh, this really just incredible opportunity uh, to try to make a difference in the lives of other people. And as I've told um, Dr. Patel and Clark Field and so many others before, uh, I think most 17 year olds, you know, they have no idea what they wanna do for the rest of their lives. And I, I love this Brad Paisley song because it says at 17, it's hard to see past Friday night. And I think what, you know, this means to me, at least at that age, most of us, we have no idea what we want to do for the rest of our lives. Um, and I think I very much fit into that 
you know, category. We don't necessarily appreciate uh, the people that we have in our life. And so when this incident happened, it really was a huge wake up call. And I remember um, actually uh, sitting, uh, uh, I was actually uh, sitting in the, um, uh, in my room. I had been out of the hospital for about a couple of weeks. I had a tracheostomy tube. I had these beet red scars up and down my neck. And I, I walked to the, to the restroom and I'm looking in the mirror. And what I didn't realize is that my, my father was standing in the corner. And I think, you know, dad like looked in and he saw this kind of look of devastation uh, in my eyes. And he came in and I, you know, he did something that really kind of changed the entire trajectory of, of my life in many ways. He said, you have two choices. The first is you can, you know, decide to feel sorry for yourself. Um, and the second is you can take this horrible incident and turn it into something positive. And that's really, you know, what inspired me to go into medicine. It's what inspired me to, you know, then become a trauma surgeon. And it's what then recently has pushed me to work at the intersection of medicine, public health, and public policy. And I'll tell you, I show you this picture here because I would not be here without all these people in my life who have been there through, you know, the good times and the bad, uh, you know, regardless of what's going on. And all of us have these individuals in our life that help prop us up, especially uh, at times when we need it the most. And it's really what ended up taking me to NSIH. And I, I'm just so I never expected to go to NSIH. Um, I think like I told you, my, my parents had immigrated to the States and they were actually living in Israel uh, before they uh, came to the US and had spoken so highly about um, both the medical education and just the experience uh, and the culture uh, that Israel brings, um, not just to its surrounding communities, but to, to the world really. And so I had you know, the opportunity to uh, spend an incredible number of years, really as, as many of you know, in addition to the, to the basic kind of US science curriculum, exploring things that really focus on vulnerable uh, populations, whether it's disaster preparedness or refugee healthcare. And that was really just was so powerful. And it really prompted everything else that happened in my life. I ended up going back to Fairfax where um, I was a surgical resident uh, under the individuals that actually operate on me. And that was um, really honestly something that is hard to even articulate in words, what it means to operate with the people that saved your life and feeling that you had to be, you know, the best version of yourself possible. It also then, you know, led me to the trauma center at Penn where I really refined uh, my skills as it relates to traumatology and surgical critical care. And I think one of the things as I was at MSIH thinking about how do I, you know, really incorporate the theoretical and practical skills of public health had gotten me to, um, Take a, take a year off and spend a year at Hopkins doing um, an MPH. And this really um, had a lot to do, honestly, with uh, Rivka Karmi, Chaim Nagan, who, you know, I think put so many of those important principles around public health into my mind, making me realize that there is a lot of work to be done beyond simply the operating room or beyond the trauma center. And I love this motto uh, at Hopkins where it says protecting health, saving lives millions at a time. And I think this really kind of demonstrates both the opportunity and the responsibility that we have to really think beyond just the individual patients that we take care of. You know, as time goes on, I think we, you know, at least for me, the more I learned, the more I realized how much I didn't know. And when I was in my first faculty position at MUSC, I started really kind of thinking about the policy implications uh, around healthcare and how, how all of this really has to come together. And so I ended up spending a year at the Kennedy School, uh, which was a tremendous year really understanding um, the integration of public policy as it relates to healthcare. And most recently, I was able to take that theoretical experience and apply in a very unique opportunity at the federal level, working as um, a, a health policy, one of the Robert Wood Johnson health policy fellows in the office of uh, US Senator Maggie Hassan. 
And this, as all of you know, this past year, um, I ended up being more useful, frankly, than I thought I was gonna be because of COVID and the public health kind of implications of you know, the worst pandemic in modern history. So I just give that as kind of like an outline of, of where I've been and where I'm currently at. I, I'm back at Hopkins now uh, as one of the trauma surgeons and excited to be back here and just recognize that I wouldn't be here without the incredible uh, mentors uh, that I've had in my life. I don't have any obvious uh, pertinent disclosures to this talk. So we'll, we'll quickly kind of outline the scope of the problem. Um, I'm gonna talk initially a little bit about gun violence because this is the area I work uh, a lot in, but we're also gonna highlight the health uh, inequity issue as it relates to so many other disease processes. We can't cover everything, right? And I think it's important to note that literally uh, you could spend you know, an entire semester studying all of the health inequity problems that exist and still not get through everything. So this is a snapshot to kind of give folks a little bit of a picture. And we'll talk about some of the challenges moving forward. And we're gonna end again in, in a little bit of a different way in me talking to all of you about like, the importance of telling your story and public narrative and being able to take that narrative and turn it into action. You know, I wanna uh, start with this picture because I was, I, I think this is important and you'll see at the top, it says uh, perception. And I, and I show this for a couple of reasons. The first is this, this was a picture that was taken when I was in college. I was a firefighter at the city of Fairfax. And some of you that are looking at this picture are probably thinking, okay, you know, there's Joe, um, another photo op as the building behind him burns down. And the reality of that picture is this was a training exercise. And so as we had come out of the building, the other team had gone back in. And I show this because I think it's important to understand that perception is not always reality. And as we talk about really emotionally charged issues, whether it's gun violence or racism, I think it's important to really listen with the uh, intent to understand versus you know, the intent to like just simply judge people. And I think some of you have probably experienced this where you walk into a meeting and you hear someone that says something that you may not agree with. And so if you think about what happens when that scenario takes place, it's actually quite interesting because you, know, you stop listening to them and we know that 90% of communication is nonverbal. So they stop listening to you. And the breakdown in communication doesn't just happen for that one instance. Because in the future, you remember that this is the person that said something you don't necessarily agree with. And so I think, you know, I really try to do, um, again, I'm not perfect, but try to do the best job possible of trying to hear other people's point of views and understand where they're coming from. And I think that this is important. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm in the States, but I think in general, you know, whether you're in the States or you're in Israel or elsewhere, a lot of us as humans, we have a lot of the same um, end goals and ideas. I think the difference lies in sometimes the ideological kind of drive of how we get there. And so that commonality that exists among us, I think is so important. You know, for firearms, you can see that um, uh, this is a, a public health problem that we face uh, in the U.S. And you can see there that two thirds are actually suicides, which most people don't even discuss. A third homicides and the other unintentional and a potpourri of other, other things. And I think what's interesting is when you look at this, it is so critical. And again, you know, this is not going to be a uh, talk just on, on, on fire injury, but I just want to show you one aspect of it. It's so critical that you look at this by age, gender, and race. And so when you look at what happens, right, for individuals here as it relates to, to homicide rate, you can see all ages is about four and a half per 100,000. Well, what happens when you look at white males? Well, you can see that number drops. Okay, well, we know trauma and, and gun violence is a disease of young people. So what happens when you look at young white males? Well, you can see that number goes up, in fact, goes up greater than, than all ages. What about now looking at black males? 
you can see how that drastically goes up. You can imagine the next thing I'm gonna ask is what about young black males? So just take a look at this for a second and look at the disparity that exists when you compare this by age, by gender, right, and by race. It is significant. And I tell you this because I think we have a conversation issue in the US where a lot of the gun violence is highlighted on these mass shootings. And I'm not trying to um, you know, say that it's not important to focus on mass shootings and to figure out how do we deal with this aspect of gun violence. But the reality is, is mass shootings are less than 2% of the entire public health problem. And we've seen this happen, whether it's at Mother Emanuel or other areas across the country. And it's horrible and it's part of what we have to solve. But I love to show this picture because this is one of my colleagues, Dr. Campbell from, from UCSF. And he had walked out after taking care of a couple individuals after the YouTube shooting. And one of the things that he was really surprised about was the fact that there were all these reporters outside. And it was, I think uh, they had two patients that had been brought in at the time. And what he said to them was, you know, where were you when, you know, four African-American men were brought in yesterday? And I think this highlights the point that, you know, um, the media doesn't necessarily always focus on the fact that every day in cities all across America, cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, there are young black men that are being killed on our streets. And those stories often go untold. So I think we have a responsibility to tell those stories. Now, the issue goes far beyond gun violence. And I love this you know, piece where it says, you know, all human beings, regardless of race, we're more than 99.9% .9 the same. It's pretty kind of fascinating. Yet that small difference has a lot of implications. And as we look at racial health disparities, right, uh, it's significant really, frankly, across the board. I mean, whether you're looking at um, death rates for heart attack and stroke, which are 29 and 40% higher respectively for blacks compared to white Americans, or if you're looking at African-American women who are less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer than Caucasian women, but are 40% more likely to die from the disease. And the same exists for cervical cancer, right? Black women are twice as likely to die from cervical cancer than white women. And the story goes on. So we're gonna show some of these different examples um, so you can see how they're highlighted. And again, I just picked some primary examples, but there are many that one could show. So when you look at appendicitis, I, I treat a lot of appendicitis. Appendicitis is one of the most common um, causes, surgical causes of abdominal pain. And in fact, when you look at this study, uh, nearly 1 million children between 2003 and 2010 were diagnosed with appendicitis. And what this study found is that pain associated with this disease process is undertreated in pediatrics. In fact, only 57% of nearly 1 million children diagnosed with appendicitis received any analgesia at all and only 41% received at least one dose of opioids. And the group with the absolute lowest levels of treatment were African-American. In fact, black children are less likely to receive any pain medication for moderate pain and less likely to receive opioids for severe pain. So when you look at this, to just summarize it, black children had one fifth the odds of receiving opioid analgesia than white children, even after adjustment for potential confounders, right? And so, you know, if we allow this to happen to children, those who can't speak for themselves, then how do we fare for adults? Are we better when we as adults are vocal? And I think the answer you're gonna find is, is shockingly uh, no. Um, we, we wrote this piece in the Scientific American a few months ago um, talking about racism in healthcare and how it's not always obvious. And, you know, one of the things that we started off by saying is that, listen, you can have, you know, um, two different individuals that come to a doctor's office to determine whether or not they need a procedure. And you can have the same 
presenting signs and symptoms, but the dem and the overall demographics are, are are similar. But you have one person that's white and one person that's black, and the procedures that are recommended are not always the same. Some of you might find that surprising, but let's look at some of the data. So this was, um, I think, a really fascinating um, study uh, that uh, looked at 720 uh, physicians. And they were looking to see if there was a bias, whether implicit or explicit, that is leading to a difference uh, in, um, uh, in outcomes. And what they did is they, did, they looked at this at a primary care physicians national meeting with three different uh, simulated scenarios. And each physician uh, viewed a recorded interview that had presenting symptoms, uh, associated cardiac symptoms, relief of symptoms, and duration of symptoms. And they were viewing the data. And after, they, after that happened, they had to make recommendations about the patient's care. Now, all the patients had identical insurance. You can see here, I've listed some of this stuff. They had uh, identical occupation. They had uh, identical vital signs, cholesterol, smoking history. None of them had diabetes. Um, all had a father who had an MI above the age of 75. And the physicians had to describe the type of chest pain to estimate the probability of it being clinically significant and to ask if they wanted further testing, right? And they were asked to estimate the probability of coronary artery disease and if the patient should have a left heart cath. And when you look at the results, they're stunning, but just to kind of summarize is that women in blacks were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization than men and whites respectively, right? And these are, you know, physicians that are, you know, theoretically supposed to just provide the same type of care to individuals, but the reality is, is that's not necessarily true. When you look at um, other studies, and this was another really, I think, uh, in my mind, a landmark study that looked at, it was conducted in 2007, and it looked at uh, four different academic medical centers. You can see them there, uh, Emory and the three uh, Harvard uh, hospitals. And the objective was to test whether physicians show implicit race bias and whether the magnitude of such bias predicts thrombolysis recommendations for black and white patients with acute coronary uh, syndromes. And you can see here they had about 200, almost 300 um, ER and medicine residents. And they use these different clinical um, uh, vignettes. And they had this questionnaire um, that used an implicit association test. Now, this was developed by Harvard, and it's a tool that's been employed in over 200 different studies. And what they found is that all three uh, IATs showed statistically significant effects with stronger um, associations of negative attributes to blacks than to whites, right? So you can see this, and this was done in a, you know, a very objective way. When you look at you know, what physicians were reporting, physicians reported that they had no explicit preference for white versus black. But when you looked at the implicit bias test, that clearly was not true. Where there was a preference in favoring whites, there were stereotypes of blacks not being as cooperative with medical procedures. Uh, and black physicians had actually mean scores on all three of the IATs near zeros, where all other groups had scores in the pro-white range. So you can see that despite the explicit bias of someone saying that they don't actually have a preference one way or the other, the implicit bias is actually there. And when you look at physicians with pro-white implicit bias that was increased, so did their likelihood of treating white patients and not treating black patients with thrombolysis. Again, a really um, significant, I think, study that just illustrates the fact that the implicit bias does exist. 
and is often not recognized. So the, the last kind of main study I just want to uh, show folks is this study that looks at in-hospital um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And this was using Medicare data, looking at the incident of, of CPR and the rate of survival. And they looked at both patient and hospital level, level uh, predictors to discharge. And when they looked at all of this, they found that survival is poorer for black and other non-white patients. And that there was you know, no significant change in overall uh, survival between the study period. And adjusted odds of survival for black patients were nearly 24% lower than those for similar white patients. So the association between race and survival hospital effects, black patients were more likely to undergo CPR in hospital uh, that have lower rates of post CPR survival. And among patients surviving in hospital CPR, the proportion of patients discharged home rather than a healthcare facility decreased over time. This is not just in these prior studies that we have seen disparities and health inequity. We've also seen this and it's been highlighted significantly throughout the COVID pandemic. When you look at hospitalization rates and characteristics of patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19 and you look at the differences among white and black individuals across the country. And you can look at this nationally and you can also look at this from a state perspective where despite you know, the best intentions, healthcare workers um, take the complaints by white patients more seriously than those that come from communities of color. And so, you know, this is just, I think, a very small kind of uh, lens into this public health problem that we are facing uh, in America. And when you look at uh, these issues, I think it's very, very complex. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this as we talk about the social determinants of health and things like housing and you know, food security and education, or if we're talking about you know, the ability to you know, be able to afford your medications or to actually have trust with your healthcare provider or your healthcare system, right? Or what about you know, the fact um, that frankly there exists this rub, and we see this in Baltimore sometimes, between the surrounding community and the very wealthy healthcare system. These are all issues um, that you know, relate to the structural problems that exist that have prevented us really, I think, from making headway on some of these different uh, factors that we've discussed. And part of, I think, what we have to do and what there is a significant focus on is trying to break down the silos that exist within cities. Right now you have you know, these structural issues, you have public health department issues, you have hospital and healthcare issues, and they're siloed off. We need to break down these silos and get people working together in parallel. And that's been something that has been a big focus, I think, in cities across America as well, most recently at the national level um, but we have a, a ways to go. As it like specifically relates to gun violence and what we're seeing here, it's, it's very similar, right? Um, whether you're talking about treating the patient that's coming in with a potential MI versus treating you know, gun violence epidemic that we're seeing in Baltimore and across the country, there is a biopsychosocial disease that often doesn't get considered. And so in order to treat these complex public health problems, we have to really um, you know, change our focus. A lot of times we're trying to change human behavior, which we know in and of itself is not cost effective. We really have to approach this in a way that allows us to develop a system that makes it less likely for people either to become ill or in this case injured. So framing it in that way is so critical. One of the things that's come out of COVID is, I think, um, a stronger magnifying glass on the 
the health um, inequity that exists. And in order to address this, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, as well as the CDC Foundation, established a health equity task force. And this task force was a very robust task force with individuals from all across the country with all different experiences. And really, the goal was to monitor and try to address the disparate impacts that we're seeing on vulnerable populations, including communities of color. And so a, a data consortium was created uh, and there was really four different key components here. The first is they uh, partnered with Google in order to establish this task force to have this multi-sector data consortium that is devoted again on COVID-19 impact, but I think will actually have repercussions way beyond COVID-19. But then um, developing a standardized evidence-based practice, trying to figure out how to be socioculturally responsive uh, from a resource perspective and from a technical perspective, and really trying to bring together the local, regional, state, and national organizations so that they can improve this collective response, whether you're talking about simple data collection or you're talking about therapeutic interventions or things like testing. I think the third piece is really trying to analyze some of the different policies that exist among jurisdictions that can exacerbate or alleviate uh, the COVID-19 outcome. And then of course, a real focus on mental and behavioral health, which you know, my brother's a child psychiatrist, so we talk about this all the time, the lack of access um, is just, just horrendous and something that really needs to be addressed. Uh, Daniel Dawes, who's the executive director of um, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, a phenomenal um, uh, individual who's really been a leading force for health equity. And he wrote this book uh, called uh, The Political Determinants of Health. Uh, if you get a chance, I highly uh, recommend it. It really, I think, puts a lot of these things into perspective and provide some really concrete ideas about you know, what happens from a policy perspective is really impacting individuals uh, at, the, at the community level. Again, there's not enough time to cover so many things, but this was an incredible document that um, uh, was really covering the health inequities uh, that exist in Israel. And I think when you look at Israel as a whole, and I, I've attached the the PDF there, it's a really tremendous document with a lot of good uh, information. But when you look at Israel as a whole, the life expectancy is high actually, and infant mortality rate is low when you look at it by OECD standards. However, when you stratify it based off of different indicators, whether it's looking at um, non-Jews versus people living in more rural areas or the periphery or socioeconomic uh, status, we know that those populations actually have uh, worse um, health outcomes. And so uh, again, there's probably people on here that know way more about this than I do and be appreciate your comments and thoughts. But I think the Ministry of Health really is taking this seriously about trying to figure out how do we tackle uh, health inequalities. And I think we all realize whether it's in Israel or the US, it's quite a complex uh, undertaking. So I'm just going to end with a few things about really kind of telling your story. And, you know, as a surgeon, when I talk about this, I think a lot of my colleagues, especially in the surgical world, think this is a little bit foo-foo. And they're like, oh, what is, you know, what are you talking about, Saccharin? Like, you know, it doesn't really necessarily always make sense to them. Um, and I think hopefully you'll find uh, why this is important. And I think one of the things that I've been really proud of over the past few years is seeing how integral um, clinicians have been, not just docs, but, you know, the entire like clinical, um, you know, spectrum of individuals that care for patients as it relates to social movements. And, you know, this was a great piece out of Philadelphia by one of my colleagues, Dr. Goldberg, that said an apolitical profession wakes up and she was referring to the trauma surgeons that spoke out about gun violence. And, you know, a lot of you probably heard about what happened in 2018 with This Is Our Lane when the NRA came out and said that, you know, we as doctors didn't have a role in coming up with solutions as it relates to gun violence prevention. All of us, you know, that care for these patients obviously know that, 
you know, we're the ones that are, are, are there taking care of them day in and day out. And I, I think, and I think many others do as well, that we're really a central part of this conversation. And those move, you know, those things that happen, they may sound like small kind of things in the grand scheme of, of what we're doing in healthcare, but they lead to a lot of incredible, incredible um, collaborations and things that you may never expect. And this specifically led to uh, the largest uh, medical summit, I think across really any um, public health problem where uh, there were 44 organizations that were brought together, all the leading professional organizations to discuss how do we approach issue from a public health perspective. And you can see there, you know, some of the public health interventions that we came up with, whether it's, you know, safe storage or, you know, dealing with the social determinants of health, like we were just talking about, or policy. One of my uh, professors from the Kennedy School, Marshall Gans, uh, who's the world expert in uh, public narrative, he talks about, um, you know, this in, in terms of the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And it's actually really fascinating because, you know, I think most of us as clinicians, as scientists, as researchers, we're so focused on the data. And I, I don't want to minimize the fact that, of course, the data is important. But the reality is, is the data does not change the hearts and minds of people. And that's important if you want to actually see change. And he talks about this in terms of going from value to action, whatever that value may be. For me, it's, you know, ending gun violence, right? That's my why. For each of you, it's gonna be different. But in order to do that, it's done through emotion. It's done through being able to tell those stories. And the story doesn't have to be as dramatic as being shot in the throat, right? Each and every one of you have a story and figuring out how to package that up and how to deliver it is critical. In fact, I always ask my medical students, I'm like, hey, I'm like, what's your story? And at the beginning of the rotation, they're like, I'm a third year medical student on your rotation and I wanna do this, right? By the end of our rotation, their answer is very different. And so just something for all of us to think about. If you haven't seen this Simon Sinek talk, um, this focuses a little bit more on the why that we're talking about, the purpose. And it's a great, it's like 10, 12 minute talk. But the point here is, is that when you look at really successful companies, like Apple, for example, the reason they're successful is not because they tell you what they're gonna do. They're successful is because they get you to believe in what they believe in, right? And that's the why, and that's what we need to capture in some of these things that we're doing. This is one of my favorite pieces out of Harvard Business Review where they've looked at, at leadership and they followed 10,000 West Point cadets. And what they did was um, they uh, looked at internal versus external motivations. So like internal motivations being things like the, the um, you know, duty to serve and external being things like okay, their school loans were gonna get paid off. You may not be surprised that those that were internally driven were actually more successful uh, along their, their career. Again, success is, is all determined by each and every one of us, but just something to consider. You know, since Parkland, there's been 1,200 uh, American kids that have been shot and killed, over 1,200. And I just think that's absolutely unacceptable. And I've just been so proud of the young people uh, in the States that I think have really re-energized the conversation, whether you're talking about gun violence or racism as a public health problem, they've really done, I think, a tremendous job. I never really kind of appreciated the power of my own story, to be honest. And it wasn't until I was in Philadelphia where I was a fellow there. And what we would do is we would bring in um, kids from surrounding areas. And we, I'd give them a tour of the trauma center and then I would talk to them about gun violence. And the first time I did this, you know, I had started, I hadn't told, I didn't tell them my story just yet. And I was just giving them an introduction to the public health problem. And they were kind of paying attention, but not really. Now look, they're 14, 15 year olds. So like we all get it, right? I went ahead and then told them my story. And all of a sudden, all of their eyeballs focused on me. And it was frankly a reaction that I had never seen before and one that I wasn't expecting. And I think in that moment, what I realized is I went from being this person 
wearing this white coat to someone that could actually relate to what these kids were facing in their communities day in and day out. And I think that's so important as we've tried to address some of these issues, right, within communities across America or in Israel or elsewhere. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple things. You know, my, Professor Gann says, if you're in public life, you have to learn how to tell your story. I would actually switch this around. I think regardless of what you're doing, you have to learn how to tell your story. I think it's so important in the impact that you can make on others. And when you look at these kids, um, they don't need a caption because they've done such a great job of telling you their story. So my thing to you is what's your story and really try to think about this. Um, the other thing I, I just wanna say and just end with is that look like I love what I do as a clinician. Um, and I found this in a fortune cookie and it said, to love what you do and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? And I think it's true. I mean, the fact that uh, someone is going to put their trust in your hands and allow you to take them to the operating room, I just can't think of anything that is just more gratifying. But one of the worst things and worst parts of my job is having to talk to these mothers and fathers uh, and sisters and brothers, frankly, and tell them that their child that left that morning is never coming home again. And I'll never forget, I think I've told, I know definitely Lynn, I've told her about this, but I'll never forget a recent um, story of a 17 year old kid who was uh, shot in the head had a devastating traumatic brain injury. And I had to go up to the ICU and talk to this kid's mom and you know, tell her essentially that you know, her child was never coming home again. And as I went up to the ICU, I was you know, in the nursing station and I was looking in and we had these big like clear glass windows and I'm looking in and I just you know, see this mom holding her son's hand. And, realizing that what I'm about to do uh, is completely rock her world. And it's the, it's, the hardest, it's the hardest part of my job. And it never gets any easier. And so I walk into this room and um, you know, introduce myself and the team to the mom. And I begin telling this mom uh, about uh, her son and the devastating injury. And uh, as I began telling her all of these things, she began telling me about her son, how he was the first in their family to graduate from high school, which in Baltimore and the African-American community is a big deal. Uh, he had hopes and dreams, just like so many of us, to go to college. And none of those will ever come true. And as you know, she was telling me that she looks up and I think she saw how emotionally impacted we as the healthcare team were as well. And she walked over and she did something that I'll just never forget, but she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, are you okay? Now just imagine this for a second. Here's a mom that just lost her son and she's asking us if we're okay. I think it's moments like that which really kind of restore uh, my faith in humanity and that get me to wake up every morning to try to make a difference in people's lives. And in my case, uh, you know, reduce farm injury and death in America. I'm here chatting with you because I have incredible partners that are doing the hard work, which is keeping the patient at the center of the equation. And I'm just so grateful for so many mentors and for all of you for really providing me the opportunity uh, to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, that was brilliant. Can you hear me? You can yes. hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. That, 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 I, I, not, not unexpectedly, that was absolutely brilliant and inspiring. And I want to thank you on behalf of all of us uh, for that. Really, when, you know, it's, it's late. It's, it's already late in the evening here, and I've been working since early in the morning, but it was really worth the wait. Boy, it was really worth the wait. So thank thanks again. That. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Our pleasure. So there are more than 100 people watching and listening to you tonight, and I got a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but I'm not going to be able to answer, ask you all the questions, but I'm, I'm gonna try and do a quick survey through them. First, before I do that, I just wanna thank our team in New York for organizing this. And it's yeah. been looked up to me, it wouldn't have been technically nearly the same. So thanks to our AEBGU and New York team. Um, uh, tell me something, just let's start with our medical students. I used early, one of your early slides, you said, it's hard to see past Friday night. I, I, that's a nice slide, probably a good song too. Tell our students what, briefly, they've got this COVID-19 year. Half of them are not even here. Most of the first and second years are, are learning from abroad. How, what kind of advice can you give them to sort of see through the year to survive until the vaccine hopefully rescues us? What, what advice can you give them? Yeah, so look, uh, the, the one thing, let me just start out by just saying the fact that um, this is hard of course, on uh, so many different individuals, but I think especially our students, whether it's the MSIH students or the students here at Hopkins, this has been like completely disrupted the entire educational like curriculum and experience that just across the world. And I think it's been something that frankly, we have never had to face in modern day history. So, I just wanna first recognize that it's really difficult and like for anyone to dismiss that, they just are either not in touch with the reality or, or, or haven't been paying attention. Um, one of the things that I would just say is that everyone is going through these, these tough challenges and this adversity. And in my kind of experience, um, adversity always makes you stronger you know, whether it's having to go, you know, do your educational curriculum, you know, through Zooms and different non-traditional ways, whether it's, you know, being injured and being a patient, all of these experiences are, are gonna make each and every one of you stronger. And I think at the end of the day, when we look back at this in two, three, five years, we're gonna remember these times and remember how all these different experiences led us to who we are as individuals. In fact, they might even drive some individuals to have more of a public health focus or maybe more of an infectious disease focus. So I would right. just say that I, I recognize the difficulty, but I would also say that like, try to make the best out of the situation that you have. Uh, I, I think so many um, educators are really you know, struggling to do everything they can um, to try to make this experience for students the best possible experience under these circumstances. And Good. so, you know, and the last thing I'll say about this is also like, I never liked the term social distancing because I think it should have been called physical distancing. Correct, um, agree. The, the human to human interaction and that lack of interaction, I think is taking a big toll on, on in individuals and society in general, but especially on healthcare workers, especially on our medical students that are now rotating through and having to see, you know, these type of issues and not really have an outlet to debrief or to, or to discuss it. So I would just say that, you know, try to find your, your safe social networks that you can still maintain some of those, those conversations because they're so critical. Great, thank you. Well, that brings me to the next question. One of our medical students, and I want to ask you the same thing, and this is, do you, this is a difficult question to answer, I know, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. How do you balance your clinical work, your personal work, your family work, your public health work? I know the answer is you don't, but how do you do the best you can? Yeah, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite answering this question because in just full disclosure, I have, I have the worst probably balance ever. It's been something, I think it's been one of my biggest weaknesses, to be honest, is, um, you know, after my incident, I was so uh, professionally driven that I forgot about my personal life. And here's what, I don't know if this will be helpful, but here's what I've, I've come up with recently. Because um, recently over the past, you know, uh, year or so, I've been trying to make it more of a, of a specific focus. And I think it's important to try to do that and make time for things that you think are priority, whether that's family, whether that's working out, whether that's spending time with friends, whatever it is, you have to make that a priority. S similar to 
to, you know, brushing your teeth or, or you know, the, the basic activities of daily living, right? And so that's what I've tried to do and actually like physically like schedule time for those things. And, and I will tell you just a couple things, which is number one, when having a balanced personal life, I actually think makes you more successful professionally. And you don't always realize that. Number two is, it's very easy to put this on the side. And next thing you know, you wake up five years later and you're kind of in the same position. You know, you may not be married or have a significant other, or maybe you don't have kids, or maybe you're not spending enough time with the family. Time is precious. Time is the most precious commodity. And what I've just essentially told myself is I don't want to have any regrets. I don't want to take my last breath and say, oh man, if only I had done, you know, this and this and this. So yes, it's great to be ambitious. It's great to do all these things, but it's also great to try to be deliberate about um, you know, the things that you're doing in your own personal life. And I think as you continue to grow professionally and you become more focused in what you wanna do, some of the things that are not really directed towards achieving your goals will fall by the wayside. And it allows you to have some more of that balance. So again, I, I feel like I'm calling the kettle black, but that's, I think the best answer. I think I that I think it's a nice, honest answer. This is not an easy thing to do, and none of us, uh, none of us who who get anything done in the world, um, uh, uh, do it by spending less time doing it. The question of balance, and I think your advice, and your your vision that in order to do what you want to do, you have to look after yourself too, is probably great for us type A type personalities. Most of most med most successful medical practitioners have some of that in them. But thank you. Um, returning to one of the subjects, uh, some of the subjects you spoke about, one of the, one, we got an interesting question about the inherent bias, the, the studies of inherent bias. The question was, do, do you know whether this inherent bias that, you, that is picked up by these studies gets better or worse with time? Uh, meaning that if it gets worse with time, is it possible that it's something learned by our profession? Or if it doesn't get worse with time, is it something perhaps we bring our biases into our practice. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think when you start looking at um, the, the field in general of looking at like disparities and these issues is relatively young compared to just medicine in general, right? That's the right. first thing to say about this. The second thing to say, I think certain aspects have gotten better in time in the sense that we're now actually starting to have those conversations and the, the realization that these disparities actually exist. And it's becoming a focus within healthcare systems, departments, schools of medicine, where this was never the case before. Now, you know, part of it is like, of course, building that infrastructure to be able to like intervene and to recognize, and we're doing it here at Hopkins where there's a big effort to look at this bias, but we still have a long ways to go. And I, right. think, I think part of it, and we saw this mark in COVID, part of it stems from the fact that we still don't have really robust data necessarily that aligns at the local state and national level. And that's part of what this collaboration that the CDC Foundation and the Satcher Health Leadership Institute are trying to do because the data is gonna be critical, not just to allow us to figure out where specifically the pockets of problems are, but also whether the interventions are actually useful and are making a difference. So having those metrics are critical. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the questions related to gun control asked whether this is, you're, you're framing it as a public health issue where many people have dealt with it as primarily a political issue. And you've just been through a very bruising a political campaign that 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 isn't really over. I'm, I, you know, it will be over soon, but it's not quite over yet. I don't want to go into it in any more detail than that. But but how how do you see this as a, a political? Because the, the question was the only way to solve this is a political solution, and why do you bring a public health uh, uh, approach to it? That's the question. Thoughts on that? Yeah, political no versus public health. Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you for that for that question. Look, a couple things. A couple things to say about this. Um, when you look at uh, public health problems and you try to define what they are, 
public health problems are complex health issues that occur in different geographic regions across the area, in this case, America, right? Right. Um, so by definition, it's a public health problem. That's number one. Number two is um, there needs to be policy that is in place to really allow people to understand uh, and to be able to address this issue. I totally agree with that. And part of that is political. But I think part of it has been political is because we've had, we haven't had a health focus on it. When you look at in the 60s and 70s, right, there were motor vehicle fatalities. And what did we do then? Did we get rid of cars? No, we just came up with, you know, seat belts and airbags and we made roads safer. We switched from really trying to figure out how do we change that human behavior that we were discussing and developing a system that makes it less likely for people to be injured. And that's why the fatality rate dropped. And so, I, so in looking at this as a disease, I'm looking at all the different ways and there's no one solution, but all of the different ways that we can implement a multifaceted approach. Some of that, right, is gonna require policy. I totally agree. And some of that policy is, you know, gonna require, you know, I think, unification and really building on the consensus that I frankly think exists in America, but we don't always see through the media or through the eyes of our politician. The one thing that I think we all sometimes forget is that at least in America, most governing happens at the local and the state level. And in fact, in 2018, there were over 67 pieces of legislation around gun violence prevention that were passed. A lot of people don't recognize that. Different now, states, you mean different, different jurisdictions? Different states, all across, yeah, states all across America. Why did that happen? Part of the reason that happened is because you have, you know, the moms, you know, showing up to the, to the state house. You have the doctors talking about what they're seeing on the front lines. You have researchers talking about the evidence of how to, like, you know, lock up your firearms. So the 4.6 million children that currently live in homes with unlocked and loaded weapons are not at risk, right? All of these different things. So the, so the public health approach has been driving those policies and what the policymakers do. Do we wanna see change at the federal level? Yes. Is it gonna be very difficult with, you know, the way it looks like the Senate is gonna be controlled and the lack of unity and the emotionally charged nature of this issue? Absolutely. But we, I think, have to continue pushing it and trying it and I'm, I'm confident, the last thing I'll say about this, and again, I don't want to get into the politics, but I'm confident that a president like Biden uh, and Vice President like Harris is going to have this as a, one of their priority issues as we finish, you know, dealing with the COVID pandemic. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex issue. Thank you. I guess all I can say to that, to that is amen. Joe, uh, we, we could go on, I, I could talk to you for another hour or two, and so too could the audience. We still have the same number of people on as at the beginning, which is a good sign. I think the COVID-19 is a terrible pandemic, but it, there are a few small benefits or large benefits. One of them is the ability for all of us to see you tonight without you having to fly here. So on behalf of all of us, AABGU, MSIH, BGU, everybody, and myself personally, uh, my guess is you would have been you would have been the same star you are whatever medical school you went to, but I'm really proud you went to our medical school, and I hope that uh, uh, you'll come back and see us in person. We, we we love to see you on screen, but we'd love to see you even more in person. So well, Mark, I got, that that means a lot coming from you, and I'm just so grateful for ABGU and for you and Lynn and so many of the individuals that uh, at MSIH and both in the New York office and Bersheva that made this happen. And you know, I don't know who's still on the um, uh, on the call or not, but just to you know, the MSIH students uh, and maybe alum that are on there, uh, I I think you're in a really special program um, that currently you may not realize how it's going to impact your career, but you know, I would say you know, keep working hard and hold the faith. And if I can ever be of any help, um, folks know how to get in touch with me. Uh, but I'm just really grateful to be with all of you tonight. Thanks for giving me the honor of, of this hour and look forward to touching base in the future.
Yeah, we really appreciate your time. So on behalf of MSIH, BGU, AABGU, I want to thank you, Joe, Dr. Sakran, and I want to say good night to Joe all because good. we promised we'd finish on time. So yeah. all the best. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay throat. Bye. Stay throat. Bye.